We all want to live in a magical land, but I'm telling you, Hollywood is far from that. Thank you for clicking on this video. I'm Brooke McKenna, but today we are going to be talking about a woman named Krista Helm. This beautiful woman was chasing her dreams, but she couldn't seem to get away from what or who was chasing her. By the way, I'm doing Suspect Summer all summer long, if you didn't know, where I'll be posting so much content like this, so I would love your support by subscribing or thumbsing up or leaving a comment down below. Now let's get back to the story. So Krista Helm was born on November 10th of 1949 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, although Krista was not her real name. She was born Sandra Lynn Walfeld. Her parents were Harry and Dolores. She was a very outgoing child. She would sing and dance around the house. She really wanted to be a movie star and she refused to be a Midwest housewife. Her dad owned an asphalt company. Her mother stayed at home with her and her two sisters, Marissa and Debbie. Her mother stayed at home with her until she was about three. And that is also about when her parents, Harry and Dolores, divorced. Harry went on to remarry and have two more children, but Dolores became an alcoholic and never really got back to her usual self. And her mother Dolores never got remarried, although she did have a series of many toxic, manipulative relationships that she brought home to the girls, and some of them even sexually assaulted the three girls as well as their mother Dolores. But Sandra's mother was so far into a dark place that she couldn't or wouldn't get them out of that situation. She wanted to stay with these men, which we see so often in manipulative, awful relationships that they just can't get out of it. And unfortunately, they stayed like that for a really long time until their father, Harry, finally said that they could come stay with him and his new wife and their kids. And Sandra idolized her father after this for doing this, but it wasn't all amazing after that, after they moved in. The home life was okay, but Sandra had horrible chronic pain from her back where she had to wear a back brace that was bulky, that hurt. It was probably very noticeable to everybody around her, which probably had a part in why she had such low self-esteem. All three sisters actually had health problems and it was supposedly said to be because their mother used diet pills while they were while she was pregnant with them. And being a teen with a bad home life, self-esteem issues, as she grew into an older teenager than to an adult, she really had some wild behavior and some behavioral problems. And even though she was still quite young at 16 years old, her harsh personality and her looks got the attention of much older men. A 26-year-old named Gary Clemens actually fell in love with her. He owned a karate studio and he was also rumored to be with the mob, but Sandra fell in love with him as well. And in a matter of weeks, she fell pregnant. And then a little while later, they had a shotgun wedding before she had the baby. When she woke up the next morning on their honeymoon, Gary was gone disappeared. When she was 17 in 1966, Sandra had her daughter, Nicole. Now Sandra was a single mother at 17, and when she went to look for Gary, she could not find him anywhere. It was like she had, he had vanished. Some said that he had a motorcycle accident in Florida where he died, but no one really had proof of that. But she had to move on with her life to support her and now her daughter and so she started working as a waitress at Trevito's, which was a, an Italian restaurant. And that is where many men kind of came up and showed interest in her. And she started dating a college student named Rolf Siebold. But instead of moving in with any man, Sandra decided to move in with her waitress friend, who was 22-year-old Diane Mitchell. She also had a daughter, Kalena who was the same, around the same age as Nicole. And so they moved in together, they got along really well, and they lived not too far from the restaurant they worked at. She wasn't, Sandra wasn't really afraid of anything back then, nothing. She was fearless, and that's probably what led her into acting, into the spotlight. It all started when their restaurant boss invited Sandra and Diane to the Playboy Club in Lake Genevaeve. They there met a famous actor named James Darren, 
and decided that they wanted to be bunnies. Sandra and Diane's mothers watched their granddaughters while Sandra and Diane went to interview to be bunnies. They were given the job right on the spot, but upon returning, Diane's mother said that she would not keep Diane's daughter, Galena. So she had to turn down the offer. And Sandra, not wanting to go on her own, turned it down as well. That didn't stop them though, and four years later, they left their daughters with a family friend and moved to New York to pursue a career in modeling. Although it was nothing like they expected in New York in the modeling scene, it was far harder. Sandra began catching the eye of and dating very important men, including Leslie Gore's fiance, football player Ray Alvarez, then wealthy Broadway producer Stuart Duncan. Sandra was working at a, as a waitress still at the Gaslight Club, and then Diane decided to go back home to live with her daughter. And that is really when, in 1971, Sandra's modeling career began to grow. Her producer boyfriend was working on a popular show called Godspell. He let her invest money in it, and when it did so well, she got a whole bunch of money back. So Sandra was really no longer struggling. She got herself a nice apartment, Corvette, she had a fancy boyfriend, was living a more lavish lifestyle, and a year later her boyfriend actually bought her a house in the Hamptons that was where the celebrities lived just because he wanted to show how much he loved her. Around this time, she also got a boob job, and that is when she invited Diane back to see her house, to have a little sleepover, to have a weekend getaway, and that is where she told her that she was changing her name to Krista Helm. When asked why, she said that an astrologer just told her to do it, so she was going to. She seemed like she had everything she wanted. She was even crowned Bachelorette of the Month in Cosmopolitan. She was living her dream. Five years later, on February 12th, 1977, Sandra, who is now Krista, was murdered walking in Hollywood when she was attacked from behind and stabbed 22 times near the neck and the face. She was also bludgeoned with a blunt object, which could have been the handle of a knife or a hammer. It was really a crime of passion. A young man crossing the street saw her lying halfway under her parked car with her keys in her hand. He said he heard her let out her last long breath, and that was it. Her murder should have been much more publicized than it was. She was a pretty well-known name in Hollywood by this time, especially in the gossip columns. And yet it wasn't. Some believe this is because of who she knew or what she knew, and people were afraid of it leaking. The theory came in big part to her missing Tommy Boy purse, also possibly contained a love diary that she had that was basically like her little black book of Hollywood celebrities. Now let me go back and explain to see how we got up to this five years later. Now while dating Stuart, he cast her as the main lead in Let's Go For Broke that they filmed in Haiti. While she was there, she had stylists, makeup artists, designers, and really made the budget soar far more than they wanted or were expecting. This really, I think, put a strain on her and Stuart's relationship, and they didn't stay together long. But Krista wasn't one to stay with a man for long. I mean, she could really get any man she wanted, and she knew that. After filming, she was said to be with New York Jets football player Joe Namath, then assistant director Ron Walsh, then adult film producer Joseph Middleton. After a while, Krista headed to Hollywood to see what she could get into there. The transition to Hollywood was pretty easy for Krista because she had so many contacts anywhere, really. When she got there, she moved in with a financer, Bernard Kornfeld, who housed several Hollywood starlets at a time in his place. While she was there, she was asked to be a high-priced call girl, but she actually denied the offer. But she was linked to many important men in her time in Hollywood. She kind of ran the party scene there, knew everyone, everybody knew her. They wanted to get in contact with her. They knew that she knew women who would be high-priced call girls or would do things for them. So she was really known and she was linked to many important men, including Warren Beatty, Michael Sarazen, Rezzo Arnaz Jr., George Hamilton, Johnny Rivers, Mick Jagger, Engelbert Humperdinck, and Roman Pulaski, who was Sharon Tate's widow. She was even said to be flown to the Shah of Iran's palace and given jewels. And some believe that the government actually used models and starlets 
to go over to the Shah of Iran's to get information about him and bring it back. They would approach her after and she would give them details of what was happening, what he was doing, what was going on, his activities, anything they wanted to know. Krista is said to have lived as a free agent though and just kind of did what she wanted and frankly just enjoyed sex. She even leaked some of the names of the men she had been with to the public and because of that it kind of was thought that she kept this love diary that was of every man she had ever been involved with and a rating system on how well they did. But this is all speculation because this diary has never been found. But some believe that is why she was murdered and it wasn't supposed to ever be found. Two years prior to her murder, she called her friend Diane again, which they hadn't talked in a while. She called her and she told her she was dating Michael Sarzan and they didn't really talk for long. And when Diane said she would call Krista back, she tried and the phone was disconnected. And that was the last time she ever talked to Krista. Although she was great with the social scene, with her connections, her acting career really never took off. She was in Let's Go For Broke, which wasn't a very popular show. She was in a Coppertone TV commercial and she also had a part in the show Wonder Woman, but that was really about it. So this leads back to the night of her murder. She attended a Hollywood party with her roommate Stephanie, which they did often, and then they called their talent agent, Stanford Smith, to come and party with them. He denied over the phone, but Krista being a charmer decided to go over to his place and try to persuade him. His place was on Lloyd's Place in West Hollywood, and she took Stephanie's car to get there. Stephanie was not in the car with her, and it's uncertain whether she was going into his house or out of his house when she was attacked, going back to her car or away from her car. But Stanford said that he never saw or heard her anywhere near his house. Something I find kind of odd is that Krista was a certified black belt. I'm wondering if she just wasn't, you would think she would be pretty aware of her surroundings. So this attacker must have been really fast and pretty strong to win against her as well. A neighbor actually came forward afterward, John Grizzy, saying that he heard a horrendous scream that night around the same time, but when he walked outside, he didn't see anything, which is possibly because she was already under the car. After her murder, it made no national headlines, and it seemed like the police were more interested in finding this love diary and the possible sexual audio tapes that she had kept from those times as well. It was found that she sent a postcard to a friend named Darlene before her murder saying, I'm in way over my head here. I'm in something I can't get out of. Over 70 people were interviewed and nothing came out of it. And the case slowly went cold. Now her daughter at the time was still staying away from her with a family friend, but Nicole was promised that she could be with her mother when she turned 10. Nicole was nine when her mother was murdered. But as she got older, she didn't have a hatred for her mother. She didn't hate her for not being with her. She wanted her murder to be solved. She got it reopened 30 years later and have got CBS 48 Hours and Celebrity Justice to cover her story. That is, when I heard that, that is when I really wanted to share Krista's story because her daughter is working so hard to do the same. Police have now actually found an audio tape of Krista a high-profile celebrity and a woman named Patty Collins, who was one of Krista's lovers and a backup singer on the record that Krista was trying to produce. But finally, Patty was located and brought in and she denied even knowing Krista Helm. But her daughter keeps fighting because her mother was taken from her when she was such a little kid and she deserves to know why. Nicole said about her mother, My mother finally found her power in sexuality as opposed to the shame her adolescent experiences had taught her. Her beauty and charm were undeniable, and once she mastered the art of manipulation, she found her way onto the path of her dreams. She was going to be a movie star. She said the lifestyles of many Hollywood starlets at the time were filled with sex, drugs, murder, and money. My mother gained it all and then lost it in a very short time. Her affairs, her beauty, and her strength enraged many who knew her. But those same attributes also brought her career growth and an array of people who truly loved and respected the beauty within her. But what happened? Who did this to Krista? Some speculate that whoever murdered her was the same person who murdered Sal Minio, 
who was co-star to James Dean in Rebel Without a Cause. They were both murdered the same day, a year apart, and there was no witnesses in either case. It was also in the same exact neighborhood. But this theory was pushed to the side because it was thought that Sal's murderer was in jail at the time, but they recently found out he wasn't. These tapes are thought to be a huge part of the motive for murder. A man named Tony Sirico, who knew the same people as Krista at the time, was asked to go over to her house to make sure her roommate Stephanie was okay. He left the house that day with tapes, as well as fur and clothing from Krista's room. Police never questioned him back then, but in 2006, when this was reopened, he was brought in where he denied everything and wouldn't say a thing even though they told him he was not a suspect. In 2007, some of Krista's missing things showed up at her best friend Lenny's house, except the diary and the tapes. The police now believe that Lenny was actually the one that sent Tony over to get stuff for her to protect Krista's image or just protect her in general. But Lenny unfortunately died before they could ask him any of this. A man who frequented the same parties as Krista, Rudy Mazzella, actually was heard bragging about murdering Krista. He was a drug dealer who carried knives and guns, and his ex-wife was terrified of him. But when he was brought in, he denied actually having any involvement, and the police kind of came to the conclusion that he was the type of person to say he did whatever he needed to say to be more powerful or to seem that way. It was also speculated that it could have been one of the men that she was with's girlfriend or wife that was really angry at her for ruining their relationship or getting in between it. And the DNA that they have tested under Krista's fingernails because she did put up a fight was found to be of a woman just recently. The woman that I was telling you about before, Patty Collins, the one that denied even knowing Krista, was tested. I haven't heard anything to say that it was her, so I'm assuming that it wasn't. This case is still unsolved to this day, and if you have any information, contact the Homicide Cold Case Unit at the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department at 323-890-5500. So what do you think led Krista Helen to this place, and who do you think did this to her? Do you think it was because of this love diary? Do you think it was because of what she did with someone and what they didn't want anyone else to know? Or do you think that this was just a random person that had hatred for her or just people in general? I really hope I did Krista's story justice, Krista or Sandra, because her daughter is working so hard to get it out there again, to get it solved. And I just hope that one day it is. She was a beautiful woman who, yes, did, regular things. She wasn't the usual nice girl, but not everybody has to be, and that was how she loved to live, so I hope none of you in the comments judge her for how she chose to live, because I think it's beautiful when you're yourself and nothing but, as long as that means you're kind. As always, leave your theories down below. Be kind to the family, because Nicole is still alive and well and wanting her mother's murder to be solved. But I thought this was a very interesting case, and I would love to hear what you think about it down below. And remember, I'm doing Suspect Summer videos like this all summer long, so please make sure to subscribe so you never miss one. Thumbs up to let me know you like them, and I'll let you guys go. Bye. Beautiful places are just a facade for strangers. The people who live there soon know of their dangers. dangers.